Hello everyone, my name is Tim, and uh, I am the host of Solid State Workshop, and today I'm going to try to give you a brief introduction to microcontrollers, and uh, hopefully by the end of this video, um, you'll have a, a good enough understanding of microcontrollers to get started with microcontrollers and to, uh, b you know, be interested in working with them, and they're really quite amazing and uh, fascinating little little devices so um, let's uh, try to figure out exactly what they do and uh, why we need them so of course probably the first thing we need to figure out is what on earth is a microcontroller and um, coincidentally I have a slide here to tell you exactly that and uh, a microcontroller in pretty much the most basic form that I could formulate is an integrated circuit also known as a chip that is programmed by a human being to do a specific task and if you want an even more simple definition of a microcontroller a microcontroller is essentially a mini computer so think of uh, your desktop or your laptop or your tablet <coughs> any of those and think of a microcontroller as the entire package um, of your computer um, but just on a miniature scale and that's essentially a microcontroller now maybe that just confused you more uh, but hopefully by the end of this video you won't be confused and if you are then let me know and I'll try to help you out um, before we get into the more scientific stuff, let's try to just uh, think about where we find microcontrollers and uh, hopefully that will give you a good perspective as to um, the importance of them. So uh, the humble refrigerator, Blu-ray player, home theater, uh, TV, uh, microwaves, camcorders, cameras, printers, telephones, practically everywhere. Um, they're hidden in all these uh, all these appliances and devices and we don't even know that they're in there but you know you name an electronic um, gadget and there's a very good chance that there's a microcontroller inside there so uh, they're very unsuspecting you know uh, and uh, they're super important so it's kind of an interesting mix they're everywhere that's yeah that's what I said before okay I think for us to have a better understanding of microcontrollers we should um, examine the history a little bit so I'm just gonna try to give you a brief history of the microcontroller and um, I don't want to give you a, a giant description because I don't want to give you a, the history of electronics in its in itself here so let's just get into it uh, back in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s we had computers consisting of vacuum tubes um, and vacuum tubes worked yeah uh, but you only really saw them in big military or government computers or someone who's ex extremely rich or something or had the money to have one um, reason being is because they were a pain in the butt uh, they produced a ton of heat, consumed a ton of electricity, were very unreliable, and of course that meant big maintenance costs, and uh, it was just a mess. They worked, yes, but it was a mess. So luckily, um, in the late 40s, we had the development of the transistor, which is monumental, because pretty much every electronics device that exists today is based off the transistor and without it we'd have nothing really nothing none of the electronics that we have today would exist uh, so uh, the transistor was like the vacuum tube but it did everything the vacuum did vacuum tube did and more in a smaller package at a cheaper cost um, took less power and produced less heat for the same operation that a vacuum tube would do and then in the 60s we crammed a lot of transistors into a single chip and um, 
or not a lot, but at least a couple transistors onto a single chip. So what this meant is that we got more transistors in a, a small amount of space. And so that improved density. That meant that we could build more powerful computers um, in a smaller space than previously before. And then in the 70s, we had the advancements of the microprocessors and microcontrollers, which... Um, uh, well, the microprocessor was developed by Intel, and then um, shortly thereafter, the microcontroller was developed by Texas Instruments. And the first microcontroller ever is uh, the TMS-1000. And um, I'm going to tell you, if I just confused you, I said I just said two different words there. I said microprocessor, and then I said microcontroller. And don't be confused, the microprocessor and microcontroller are different. And uh, we'll look at that right now. So, as I just said, there's a difference between a microprocessor and a microcontroller. Um, neither are better than the other. So don't first get that out of your head. They're just two different beasts. They're different. Uh, the micro microprocessor um, does one thing, and the microcontroller does the other thing. Does another thing. So uh, let's let's look at that uh, because most likely you've heard of the term processor before uh, but you might not have heard of microcontroller so let's think let's look at this first things first a microprocessor is used in general computing uh, what do I mean by general computing well in your laptop or your tablet or your desktop those are general computational machines because you can practically do anything on a computer uh, just think about it you can watch this video you can edit a picture you can play games you can write a word document you can send an email uh, so many things you can do on a computer uh, a microcontroller on the other hand does one thing um, it's not as versatile um, so that's why you see them in appliances and in specialized devices um, like as I mentioned before maybe in a microwave how many things can you do on a microwave can you play a game on your microwave no uh, can you write a letter on your microwave no right so that's where you'd use a microcontroller where it's just constantly doing one thing speed microprocessors because they have just a giant giant slate um, of activities that it has to be able to do they have to be extremely powerful they have to be extremely extremely pa extremely fast uh, that's why when you get a processor like in your computer it's rated in gigahertz one gigahertz two gigahertz uh, three gigahertz that's very fast um, but a microcontroller on the other hand doesn't have to be fast um, it doesn't need all that power just do something simple like like as I said to run a microwave it doesn't need that it's just it'd be wasteful to have something like that a microprocessor requires many external parts because a microprocessor only processes data it does not store data it has no memory you know you can't put programs onto a microprocessor because the only thing it does is all it does is it does like math that's it nothing else um, it's not very smart it's pretty stupid a microprocessor alone is very dumb it doesn't know anything because all it does is crunch numbers a microcontroller on the other hand has a lot of stuff built into it it has memory it has ways to communicate with the external world um, it has uh, everything pretty much set up for it to work as a standalone device and that's the beauty of a microcontroller a microcontroller can be used pretty much alone it doesn't need external parts because it's all internal to it um, microprocessor yes is very fast as I said but in order for it to work you need external parts you need to add the memory to a microprocessor you need to add uh, storage and ways to interface with the outside world because it's pretty dumb uh, cost microprocessors are expensive because 
they're ridiculously complicated and they require some really really high-tech processes uh, uh, manufacturing processes to create them because they're really all of them are well at least today are really bleeding edge and uh, that's why they're expensive uh, though there are cheap process processors out there um, the ones that you encounter today are 50 60 70 80 100 200 dollars a piece so they're pretty they're pretty expensive microcontrollers on the other hand um, are internally a little more simple though they have more functionalities like they have more peripherals and stuff built into them um, they're uh, they're less complicated for the most part some are really complicated of course there's exceptions to everything uh, but that's why they're a little cheaper um, you know um, energy use processors again are really powerful they take tons of energy uh, well tons comparing it to the microcontroller which just sips energy uh, at least most of them this is a this is just a general statement about microcontrollers and microprocessors now vendors who makes them and you're probably familiar with people who make microprocessors you have uh, Intel and AMD and ARM arm um, if you're familiar with these you might be you might have seen them you know on your computer box it might say Intel inside or AMD or whatever microcontrollers on the other hand you might not have ever heard of these companies in your life like what's an Atmel or an ST or a microchip or Texas Instruments you probably have heard of but you didn't know that they made microcontrollers did you or maybe you did I don't know maybe you're really smart and maybe you shouldn't be watching this video because you're a genius I don't know uh, but why why do we not know any of these brands here like why don't I get to choose the microcontroller I want and the reason is because the electrical engineer is going to say okay this is the best microcontroller for the task and um, it's better for him just to pick the best one instead of giving you the option because if he gave you the option well you don't really know any better uh, the engineer is the one who knows the exact application how it's going to be used so that's why you don't really get to choose that so just as a quick quick recap microprocessor is just say this green box alone that's it uh, but you gotta add all these things to it look at all these things we have to add I mean it's useless unless you add all these things to it uh, and the micro microprocessor again is just just this green box here that's it just this nothing else that's it controller on the other hand plop it puts all of those things under the hood under one hood under one package the micro pro the micro control the microcontroller puts all of these um things i'm going to call them things cuz i don't really want to describe all of them right now but all these really useful things and packages them together for you which makes it easier to use and um cheaper and uh more effective in general so let's think about what the basic principles of operation um, of a microcontroller are and we really haven't talked about really how microcontrollers work at all we described a lot of of what but we really haven't just we haven't really talked about how or why much so this is we're gonna start getting into some more actual engineering stuff here so Microcontrollers are used in specific applications. They don't need to be powerful because the applications they are used in don't really require a lot of power or a lot of storage or a lot of memory or whatever. Um, and something we haven't talked about is that a microcontroller needs to be programmed by a human being to be useful. Um, microcontrollers just don't know what you want to do with them because uh, they can be used in so many different applications as we've talked about but in order for it to be used you need to program it a human being needs to be uh, needs to know uh, how to program it and uh, of course well, he has to know how to know it how to do it uh, anyway but uh, a microcontroller is only as useful as the code written for it 
Um, so I have a little example here. If you wanted to turn on a red light when a temperature reached a certain point, the programmer would have to know explicit would have to ex explicitly specify how that would happen through his code. Um, so really, all I'm trying to say is that again, microcontrollers don't know what you want them to do. You have to tell them, and you have to program them. So as we've just talked about programming, this is the general sequence that you have to follow to program a microcontroller. So you're going to write code for the microcontroller on a computer in something called an integrated development environment, which is a PC program or Mac program or Linux program or whatever program you want, whatever you want to use. Um, and this code is written in a, a high level programming language. Uh, generally like C or basic um, or lower level languages like assembly and then the integrated development environment kind of proofreads your code for you and says okay you forgot a semicolon here or you forgot this here you forgot this here and then you had to make that correction uh, but note a a compiler or integrated development environment is not going to like write your code for you. It's just going to give you kind of like punctuation, punctuation errors. That's all it's really going to tell you. It's not going to say this is a better way to write this because it really has no idea what you're trying to write. Uh, but it's really just going to say, you know, like you forgot a period, uh, you forgot to capitalize this letter or something like that. And then uh, what I was trying to say is that then the IDE or compiler compiles this kind of pseudo English kind of code written in it's it's a it's a human code and then it translates this human code into binary code which the microcontroller can execute because the words that we write in a program don't mean anything to a microcontroller a microcontroller likes ones and zeros that's it and then we use a programmer, which is a piece of hardware, not a person, not a human being. Um, and we use a programmer to transfer the code from the PC to the microcontroller. And the most common type of programmer that we use is something called an in-circuit serial programmer, also known as an ICSP. And here's the basic kind of flow chart here. We have a computer. You write all your code on that computer, and then you, s you use a, a programmer, and then you send it to your, your project, to your application board here. And as you can see on the board here is the microcontroller. And then we can program that, and we can keep programming that. We can program that as many times until we get it right. Uh, essentially and then once you do all these steps and you got everything right boom it works presto complete yeah that was corny okay uh, now again I've talked about a lot of what and you might kind of understand how it works but now that if you really think about it you probably don't understand uh, exactly how it works how does a microcontroller interface with the real world and as you can see here, I have something up on the screen that says the analog to digital converter. Scary, right? Well, uh, there's a lot of built-in functions, as I told you, in a microcontroller, which is why it's so widely used and so useful, is because it has all these functionalities that are built right into it. And one of the most important things that a microcontroller has built right into it is something called an analog to digital converter and this is usually just called an ADC uh, so this might confuse you or it might not confuse you I don't know but uh, let's try to think about this so just about every modern microcontroller contains an ADC or multiple ADCs some of them have several um, and an ADC's job as I've as you might be able to just see is to convert an analog voltage to a digital value a digital representation of that voltage that it can store so these digital representations um, 
can be analyzed in the code you write for the microcontroller. You can log these these values in memory, and you can practically use it any way you'd like. Um, and that's why why analog digital converters are just so useful because it's so versatile. Everything microcontrollers are just very versatile chips, and that's as I've said, reiterating. You could probably use a microcontroller for practically any project you'd like ever think of ever. This is how a mar how an analog to digital converter basically works. So you're going to have a signal. Say we have a sine wave, right? Boom, sine wave, right? Now, we want to be able to convert. We want to be able to store this sine wave in our microcontroller. We want to take a picture of it. We want to take a snapshot of it. So what the microcontroller does is it takes samples of this wave at very precise intervals. Um, microcontrollers, as we as we said, work at um, a certain frequency, a clock frequency. Uh, so it has a built-in clock, so it can it can take measurements of this wave at very precise intervals. Um, so what does that mean? Well, here I'll give you a little demonstration. So let's let's hook up our ADC to this sine wave and let's see what would happen. Boom 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 boom. Right? So this is essentially how the ADC is working. At every point here uh here or here or here or here or here or whatever um, it takes a sample of the waveform. So at this point, um, at this point here, it might say uh, it'll it'll find the value of negative two or something, and then here it'll take a value of negative one, and then here it'll be positive one or positive two, positive two and a half or something like that, um, at very very precise intervals. So in between these sample points here here and here between these sample points um, it might be a microsecond or a nanosecond or a very very small amount of time these things work incredibly fast um, so what this means is that let's get rid of the actual signal and then we can piece it together like this like this like this like this and then let's get rid of those sampling lines and that is how essentially the microcontroller is interpreting that waveform. Of course, it doesn't look perfect at all, uh, but I did that so that you could kind of get the point. Um, usually, well, not usually, it depends on the application, but um, you'd use an uh, analog to digital converter that would be appropriate for the waveform you're using. Uh, so. Uh, you might understand that'll make sense later uh, but essentially that's what's happening there it's taking a sample at individual points and then it'll store those values or you can do whatever you want with those values and you can make stuff happen so here's an example of where an analog to digital converter could be used and I'm gonna be using the example of a digital thermometer and um, how can we use an ADC to measure temperature of the real world? Um, and it's really quite simple here. So there's a couple concepts that you should know, um, or else this little discussion here will make little or no sense. Um, the first thing you should know is Ohm's law. Second thing you should know is what a voltage divider is. Uh, and the third thing you should know is what a PTC is, which is a positive temperature coefficient resistor. Um, if you don't know what those are, I don't really want to explain it right now because I feel like I'll do a bad job. So it would be probably more beneficial if you just looked those up uh, and stop and look those up real right now. Uh, and if you do know them, I'll try to go forward and explain to you how um, an ADC can be used to measure temperature. So let's look at our PTC specifications. 
the PT, spe PT specifications are telling us that at 25 degrees Celsius, the PTC has a resistance of 100 ohms. <laughs> and then if we increase temperature by 1 degree Celsius, our resistance will increase by 1 ohm. So we can deduce from that that at 26 degrees Celsius, we have 101 ohms. And at 24 degrees Celsius, we'll have 99 ohms. So it works both ways. So now we're going to throw the P throw the PTC into this circuit over here, which is known as a voltage divider. And um, we'll measure the voltage across that PTC. And the voltage across that PTC will be directly proportional to the temperature in the atmosphere or whatever it's measuring the temperature of. So that is awesome. And we also have a couple key facts over here in our PTC specifications. So knowing this, we can write some code that can convert the voltage measured across um, the PTC here to a temperature. Now, another thing. Um, a lot of microcontrollers um, have 10-bit uh, DACs. So I'm just going to be using an example of a 10-bit DAC here. Um, and you can look that up also. But essentially, what you should know is that um, a voltage can be represented. Uh, well, a voltage, really, you can only input a voltage to a microcontroller less than whatever its specified maximum voltage is. So you can't apply a thousand volts to the ADC input or else it'll blow it up. Uh, most of them are either 0 to 5 or 0 to 3.3 or 0 to 1.2 or something like that. Um, but most microcontrollers that you probably will encounter will have an input range of 0 to 5 volts. So say, um, so an ADC will represent a voltage between 0 and 5 as a number between 0 and 24, so, and 1024, rather. So, um, in this code here, we'll have, we're going to be using not the voltages, but we're going to be using these numbers, which are representative of the voltages that we measured. So, um, according to our specifications, and according to uh, a number between 0 and 1024, um, the voltage that is equivalent to uh, that should be read out at 25 degrees Celsius is 512 because um, assuming this other resistor is 100 ohms and this one is 100 ohms um, the voltage across the PTC would be 2.5 volts or half of 5 volts and 512 is ha is half of 1024 so that's the voltage that would be read at 25 degrees Celsius and we're going to use this as a ratio um, and we're going to use this in a ratio so we're going to then have to of course input the ADC we're going to have to import the a ADC and then we're going to use that command there and then what we're going to do is we're going to take the measured voltage from the ADC and put it over 512 and that will give us uh, the ratio of the ADC voltage to the ratio to no to the voltage of uh, that should be measured at 25 degrees Celsius and then that ratio we can measure we can multiply it by 25 to give us our temperature and uh, you can study that for a second but that's basically how we could do it and there's of course probably a variety of ways to do that but you don't really need to know how that works as much as that it will work and that it's possible and that anything's possible with a microcontroller so I'm sorry if that didn't make a whole lot of sense right there I tried my best though uh, but just understand that you could practically do anything with a microcontroller and an ADC so let's move on from this Drum roll, please. Yes, you guessed it. There's also an accompanying digital to analog converter. Just as there is an ADC, there's also a DAC. And um, these are usually called DACs. 
because it's easier to say DAC than DAC, I guess. I don't know. Um, but a DAC or a DAC does the exact opposite function of an ADC. Um, we know that an ADC takes an uh, analog voltage and turns it into a digital value. So therefore, a DAC must take a digital value and convert it into an analog voltage. And I have written here that it converts into a pseudo analog voltage. Um, while it can definitely create um, like regular flat voltages, um, if you want to create like a waveform, it's going to have those steps in it that we saw in a previous slide. It'll have that stepping effect. However, um, a lot of times it's quick enough to change those steps uh, to create those little steps that you can't ever tell the difference. You can't even tell the difference between a real analog voltage and one of these pseudo analog voltages created by a DAC. Um, and we, we can use a DAC for a variety of things, an enormous amount of things actually. Uh, one such thing is to synthesize or create a waveform. Um, we can create an audio signal from a microcontroller. Pretty awesome. Um, it's not even that difficult these days. Uh, maybe back in the day it was a little more tricky, but today we can we can plug and play almost put some quick code in there and we have an audio generator. And that is the beauty of the digital to analog converter. So let's go over a few applications and let's try to understand how the microcontroller is working in these applications. We're almost near the end of this video, so just bear with me. Okay. Uh, one of the one thing that I uh, mentioned before is that they that you find microcontrollers in appliances. So this board you see here, this circuit board here, is from a washing machine. And um, right there in that orange circle is the microcontroller. And um, essentially, this microcontroller is interfacing with all those, all these buttons here these are all buttons and buttons here and all sorts of stuff like that to make the microcontroller to make the washing machine work so if you were to hit this start button here the microcontroller would it would go to the microcontroller and the microcontroller would say okay the start button has been pushed so let's flip on a relay to start the big AC motor and the drum will go whoosha 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 and your clothes are clean magic right and this next one this board you see here is from a car uh, more specifically a Buick Regal um, not that it matters really uh, but microcontrollers have a lot of applications in cars and auto uh, automobiles um, for example, this board here can be used to handle something from dashboard controls like heat and uh, cooling and fans and all that kind of stuff. Or it can be used for more complicated things like timing the ignition system or uh, you know, spraying when to spray gas in the cylinders and that kind of stuff. So microcontrollers can do all of these things so from a really basic task like before like a washing machine to something more complicated like this another a pretty pretty popular or at least um, a lot of people tend to think of microcontrollers as being used in robots so here we have our friend Wally and uh, microcontrollers definitely do have a big presence in robots and robotics and uh, for example Wally here might have proximity sensors in his eyes here. And a proximity sensor is going to tell you how close you are to an object nearby. So the microcontroller, uh, again, maybe now using its analog to digital converter, reads the value from the sensor and it knows how far away it is from something. And then it will know uh, how to react. Should it change its course of direction? Should it, should it do something? Should it do something? Whatever. So that is really how microcontrollers can actually be used. And pretty much the last thing I have to talk about today is microcontroller packaging. Now packages means the shape that the microcontroller takes 
because microcontrollers come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. There's not one single type of microcontroller. There's many, many types of microcontrollers. And um, here are some of the most common types. Um, we have a dual inline package. Um, and this is pretty much the oldest form factor for a microcontroller, or for any chip for that matter. It doesn't have to be a digital chip. Um, these are through-hole parts, which means that holes are drilled in the circuit board. And these legs here go through the board. And, um, yeah, that works. They're, these are definitely still used today. They're cheap, and they're effective. A lot of times, you don't need a ton of power, and these kind of chips are appropriate. And then we also have something called a small outline IC, or a SOIC. Uh, these are surface mount chips, which means that they are soldered directly onto the top of a board. There's no holes drilled, they're just soldered right on. Uh, we have a quad flat package, which means that we have these pins, or these leads, on four sides of the chip, uh, which means we have greater density, more output, more input abilities in a smaller amount of space. Uh, these are used in more demanding applications, uh, not demanding, but you know where you need more functionality. And the latest and greatest is something called a ball grid array, which means you can put tons and tons of power into a very small package because on the underside of this little black chip here, we have ta da each one of those little balls. Um, is a pin, an input and output pin, just like, just like um, these pins here are just like these pins here or these pins there, except now look how close they are to each other and look how many of them they are. And if you've been reading these little descriptions here, we notice that we have 8 pins on this one, 18 pins on this one, 32 pins on this one, and 100 pins on this one. Um, and here's our pin density here. Um, so how many pins per uh, square millimeter and on this one we see we have 0 0.15 this one we have 0.23 this one we have 0 0.65 and on this one we have almost three pins per millimeter squared um, so what does that mean that means that we that we get uh, more amount of input and output you know of smaller amount of space um, and this is the advance here uh, these packages here are much more expensive than these packages here. Uh, these packages. Uh, but sometimes you need it. So these are the different options we have. Um, now just as a quick quick little side note, uh, this is how big our BGA package is. Scale, size, boom. That is a matchstick, a standard matchstick. Um, that is how big that microcontroller is. So some of them get really quite tiny, and it has a hundred pins on it. Rather ridiculous, I'd say. Uh, but that so last slide I have here is how can I get started? Because one of the biggest things or the biggest uh, inhibitors is that we don't know how to get started, and probably the easiest way to get started is to well, look around the internet and see how other people got started but uh, you can you can buy something called a development board for a microcontroller that essentially gets you off on the right foot you don't really have to think about much uh, you can focus on learning how to use microcontroller without driving yourself mad so a really popular um, microcontroller development board is the Arduino which has an, a microcontroller on it here but it also incorporates a lot of other things, like a way to communicate with USB with a computer. That's a USB chip there. We also have a power supply here, and we have all the pins on the microcontroller uh, right here on these pin headers, which allow us to um, interface very easily with it. We don't need solder. We don't need um, any special board. We can do it by plugging in, plugging in wires to these little headers here. makes it really easy. Uh, there's also other boards. This is a PIC 
microchip pick 16 explorer board and as you can see this one has uh, has an LCD screen on it it has more of these expansion headers and buttons and uh, probably potentiometers and all sorts of stuff on there that puts it all in the right place for you so um, you can find which one you like the best there's a lot of different development boards out there but that's probably what you want to get started with microcontrollers and it's really a lot of fun you can do a lot of things and you'll keep finding things to do with microcontrollers uh, they're really quite amazing and I definitely uh, recommend getting started with microcontrollers so thank you very very much for watching um, I love to hear your feedback um, this is my first video I've ever done on YouTube so uh, I really want to see what you have to say about it and if you liked it or not uh, thank you very much if you liked it please thumbs it up so I know and if you didn't like it thumbs it down uh, <laughs> if it was really that bad and uh, if you want more you can subscribe to make sure that you get updates on when I upload a video so thanks a lot and have a great day